Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. So, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Talking about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our faith. Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded, you know, you see the English don't know how to spell. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as the son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, where your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest take heed brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief everybody say evil and unbelief in departing from the living God but exhort one another daily so this is what we're doing today exhort one another daily while it is called today for we are made partakers of Christ okay we are shareholders of Christ Christ again meaning the anointing so we are shareholders of the anointing we are partakers of the anointing Galatians 4 says we are joint heirs with Christ okay so whatever Jesus Christ had that made him the Christ that made him operate in power we are shareholders we are partakers we are joint heirs man I'm gonna preach it we are joint heirs partakers shareholders of the very same anointing that made him Christ make us Christians okay where are we for we are more part make partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end while it is said today if you will hear his voice another time harden not your hearts is in the provocation he's repeating it for some when they had heard did provoke how about not all that came out of Egypt by Moses but with whom was he grieved 40 years again was it not with him that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, because it was not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day of this wise, and God did rest of the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remains that some might enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again he limits a certain day, saying in David, Today after so long a time, as it said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. How many times have you repeated it now? For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that entered into his rest, it's got to be capital, God's rest, also has ceased from his, that's his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Okay, so what God is saying in the book of Hebrews, he says, everything that I'm writing, 
I'm referring to the generation that walked with Moses out of Egypt right up to the promised land. The generation of a 40-year period that were destroyed because of unbelief. This is examples. But now we, we are in another generation where a lot of people are full of unbelief. But I'm addressing another group that say, don't you want to believe because I am amongst the people that is exactly the same as that group was. Hmm? Two generations. Actually, three. Okay? The one in the days of Moses... 40 years. The one, the days just after Christ, it's going to make sense in a while. 40 years. Then the third one, we put that in inverted commas. The third one, the Christ generation. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 29. Then I said to you, he's referring to that place, dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God bore you as a man carries his son, in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. Who went in the way before you to search out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night. To show you by what way you should go and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard your words and was angered and he swore. Not one of these men of this evil generation shall see that good land which I swore to give to your fathers. Turn back to Numbers 32. We just pick up where Moses spoke, so we just pick it up in another place where he stopped. We just pick it up in verse 10 of Numbers 32. The Lord, the Lord's anger was kindled on that day and he swore saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swore to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and the Kenesite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. Listen, and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. So let's go to Psalm 95. Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. So it's a prophecy. So there's a good one there in verse 6. It says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. The sheep of his hand. When your fathers tempted me, verse 9, prove me and saw my work. Verse 10, 40 years long I was grieved with this generation. And said, it is a people that do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. How many see this is more or less where we started tonight in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. That God is referring to that evil generation that heard his voice but didn't listen. And because they couldn't mix it with faith, they had no believing power. And because they didn't believe, they could not enter. They said, we will never enter the land because we saw the giants there. And God said, now let's kill this whole generation. In 40 years, I will destroy this generation. Then I will have a generation that will follow Joshua and Caleb. But he's speaking just about 40 years after Jesus died. 
So there is a generation from the day that Jesus died until the time that the book of Hebrews was written, there was just about another 40 years expired. So that's why he keeps on referring to that generation, warning the living generation, talking to the generation to come, say, God is looking for a generation that will believe him. A generation that will be the Christ generation. A generation that will be called the people of God, that will know their God and follow the voice of the good shepherd. Hmm? So when Jesus ascended, he said, now, disciples, go tarry in the city of Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. When the promise of the Spirit come, you will be clothed with power from on high. And then you will be my witnesses. So we know they went to Jerusalem. They were sleeping in the upper room, the house of Mary. And uh, coming down daytime, they were daily in the temple. Now we pick up the sermon just there in Acts chapter 2. In verse 36, I think it's good enough. Therefore, let the whole house of Israel recognize beyond all doubt. Let them assuredly know that God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were stung to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered him, them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of and release from your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise of the Holy Spirit is unto you, for your children, and to all those that are far away, to as many as the Lord our God invites and bids to come to himself. And Peter solemnly and earnestly witnessed, testified, and admonished, exhorted with much more continuous speaking, and warned, reproved, advised, and encouraged him, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. Therefore, those who accepted and welcomed his message were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourself. Listen, every word is important. We have Abram as our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now John says, you generation of vipers, do you think you can escape the wrath that's coming? So in brackets, on that generation. Because he's addressing a certain group of people. He says, you, do you think you're going to escape the wrath? He goes on to say, he's coming and he's got his fan in his hand and he's ready to kindle a fire. And I wish the fire was already kindled. Now, if you read Isaiah 9, 10, and 11, it says the following. Unto us a child is born, son is given government upon his shoulders. Then he goes on to say, and he's got his fan in his hand, his axe is stretched out, he's going to chop down the trees, and he's going to ignite a fire. And all the trees will be burned down, but they will come a branch out of dry ground. And on him shall the nations hope. And he shall be called Wonderful and Counselor and Mighty God. And this branch, the man that is called the branch, says Zechariah, is the man on whom the nation shall hope. So this branch grew out of the root of the olive tree, which means the anointing oil. So out of that came one that is called the Christ. And if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
So it says all branches will be chopped down, fire will ignite, burn down the trees. And John the Baptist refers to that when he says, who do you think you are to escape the wrath of God? He says there's going to be a fire. There's going to be a fire that's going to burn down everything that you trusted in. Everything that you believed in, everything that you stand for are going to burn down. The biggest fire was 70 AD in the city of Jerusalem where the sun was darkened for three months. They did not see the sun shone through because of the smoke that hung there. And if they could see the moon, it looked like a hairy bag coming through the smoke at night time. Okay, so the sun will be darkened in those days and the moon will not give us light and there shall be signs in the earth and the heaven, on the heaven and the earth below, blood and fire and smoke. Okay? You got it? Oh, we're just going on. We haven't started. I'm just laying foundation work. Matthew 11, John the Baptist was in prison, just about to be beheaded by Herod, you know, and uh, he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, uh, go find out, is he the one that's supposed to come or should we wait for another? She said, go tell John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, the gospel is preached, tell him, blessed is he that's not offended of me. And as the disciples turned around to go back to John, Jesus now had the crowd. They heard the question. Jesus answered the question. And he said, uh, let's pick up the story. What did you go out to see when you went to see John in the desert? Okay, so let's pick it up. Verse 9, what did you went out to see, a prophet? I say unto you more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, behold, I sent my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before you. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is saying, we are finishing the old with the greatest man born under that group of people. Now we're entering anew, where the smallest in the new will be greater than the greatest of the old. Because all the promises of God are now fulfilled in Christ Jesus. They are yes and amen. Everything that Adam missed, everything that Adam blew up, everything that he was offended of and said, this is restoration time. The first man is gone. The second man is come. Jesus said the first Adam is out. Now we're dealing with the last Adam. There's a new generation of people called the Christ generation. Do you want to be part of it? He says so, in this kingdom days. Now remember, Nicodemus came at night by Jesus and said, you know, Master, we realize that you're a man sent from God, for no man can do these wonders of God and be not with him. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Just take it in short. If you are not born again, you cannot see or enter the kingdom. So what, what happens if you're born again? You're in the kingdom. He has translated us, Colossians 1, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. If you're born again, you're in the kingdom. So John says, repent, the kingdom is right here. So after the death of Jesus, if we now receive him, what is now here? The kingdom is here. We're not going to a kingdom. The kingdom is not coming one day. Before the crucifixion, Jesus said, pray, let your kingdom come. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. If you will receive it, this is Elijah which was to come. He that have ears to hear, let him hear. Where unto shall I like this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. They said, we have piped for you and you did not dance. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and you say, yet the devil. 
The son of man comes eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works were done in you that have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And unto you, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, you shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, and hath revealed them unto peace. 23, Matthew. We're picking it up. In verse 13, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves. Neither do you suffer them that are entering to go in. Oh, I thought you were going to say amen to that. He says, you know what, you scribes, hypocrites, Pharisees. You want to stop people from coming to the kingdom. In other words, you're preventing them from going to John. Now you're preventing them from coming to me. You want to, you want to, you want to protect everybody coming to me. But I say unto you, you're not going into the kingdom. Okay, so now the rest of that chapter, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. So there's a lot of woes. Verse 32. I hope you are with me. Yes. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Behold, I send you prophets and wise men, Matthew would say, Apostles, or Luke would say prophets and apostles. Scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Now look at me. Are there people right now persecuted in synagogues? No. Are there Christians taken in synagogues and persecuted and killed in synagogues? Are people now crucified in synagogues? Okay, so he can't be talking to us. Because there are not so many synagogues left. Most of them have become churches because they left and the churches just brought them up and made churches out of them. Jesus is addressing a specific group of people. He's not talking to you and I. He's not talking to South Africa. He's not talking to France and England. He's not talking to Germany and United States. He's addressing the religious crowd of his days. He's addressing the Jewish Judaizers. He says, woe unto you, scribes, hypocrites, Pharisees. You close the kingdom for people. You know what? You're not entering the kingdom. It's more or less what John says, please. He says, you know who you are? You are a generation of vipers. You are a lot of serpents. You will not escape the damnation. You know what you will do? I'm going to send prophets and apostles. You know what you will do to my apostles? You're going to kill them? You're going to take them to your synagogues? You're going to judge them? Jesus said in John 16, Be glad that I send you the Holy Spirit. After the Holy Spirit has come, they will take you into their synagogues. And they will kill you and deliver you up and many of you will be crucified. Okay, Jesus is addressing his disciples and he's addressing the religious people. Same story, both sides, different sides of the coin. Are you with me? He says, upon that generation will come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Listen to this. From the blood of Abel, righteous Abel, unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all 
these things shall come upon this generation. Please, you've got to read the Bible. Jesus speaks to a certain group of people. He says, everything that I talk to will happen to this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets, you that stone them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathered chickens under her wings? You would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. 24. I'm just reading Bible. And Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? Jesus answered, Take heed that no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. These are the beginning of sorrows. Look at me. If you hear that teaching, they put it into now. 2007 and they put it in 1965 they put it in 1899 they put it in 1720 they put it in 1655 they put it in 1500 but Jesus you know why it never worked out in the other generations because Jesus was addressing a certain generation and he said now this generation listen there's going to be wars they shall deliver you up now he's speaking to the disciples they shall deliver you up you shall be afflicted and they shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for I Has anybody killed you lately because you believe in Christ? Thank you. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Acts 13. Paul and Barnabas came to this certain governor by the name of Sergius Paulus. And... Uh, there was a certain false apostle, Elimas by name. And he withstood Paul and Barnabas. And Paul said, you child of the devil, you are full of iniquity. The hand of the Lord is upon you. There's the false prophet. Okay, thank you. Well, okay, let's just go on. Pick it up in verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be Fulfilled. Listen to Jesus. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Back to Matthew 12. Okay. Before we read chapter 12, can you just look this way and let me help you? I set you free from all the so-called end time doctrines that has put fear in your heart. May God help all the writers of the end time books of all the left behind stuff and all the, you know, one day when we get to heaven stuff and my father's house calling it heaven. All that people that postpone everything to you to one day in heaven you'll get it. Listen, all that stuff Jesus says over and over and over. This generation will see all these things come into fulfillment. Woe unto you, scribes, hypocrites, Pharisees. Upon you will come all the blood from Abel right unto now. You're going to take the consequences because you did not receive me. Now this generation, so Jesus is standing there. John the Baptist is preaching and they say, 40 years from now, because they refer to that generation in Moses, Hebrews 3. It'll be the same as that generation in the time of Jesus. 40 years, 40 years, all shall be fulfilled now in 40 years. 
Now we have all the people preaching, and when Antichrist is revealed, and the great tribulation, and the Holy Spirit goes away, and we pay with our blood, and great tribulation, and Jerusalem surrounded by wars, Jesus said, it's fulfilled in that generation. Hmm? Chapter 12. Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speak against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, tree, tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. O oh, you generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bring forth good fruit. Evil man out of the evil treasure bring forth evil things. I say unto you, every idle word that men speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, by your words shall be condemned. Then certain of the scribes, Pharisees answered, Master, we would see a sign from you. Jesus answered, an evil and adulterous generation. He's just referring to them. Seek a sign, and they shall no sign be given them but the sign of Jonas. Now listen to whom he's speaking. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the heart of the earth. Okay. So he's talking to a generation that will witness the resurrection. Please. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. Come on. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, greater than Jonah is here. Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean listen, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places. Seeking rest and find none, then he said, I will return to my house, which I came out, and when it is come, he find it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth and take with himself seven spirits more wicked than himself. They enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. So I hope somebody sees, don't take that scripture and try and condemn people around you that the devil leave them and go and find seven words. Jesus is referring to that generation. He says, before this generation is over, they will be seven times worse than when they crucified me. It's there. Let's jump to Luke 11. The context is verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of man, he walks in dry places. When the people were gathered thick together. Listen, there's an awesome crowd. Jesus is the speaker. When the crowds were gathered thick together. Are you there? Jesus began to say, this is an evil generation. Okay, can somebody just say, Phew. And these writers and preachers put that by us. They want to say, we're going to go through this stuff. And Jesus refers to that generation. You hear? The best is yet to come. This is an evil generation. They seek a sign. They shall no sign be given them but Jonah's the prophet. Do you see it's the same context? For as Jonah was a sign, listen to this. I'm just picking it up in Luke to get the full context. As Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man to this generation. Now, I don't want to go too deep into it, but if you want to go back to, to, to Matthew 23, 24, and go further in Luke, which we're going to touch on now, he says, and they shall see the sign of the Son of Man. They shall see the sign of the Son of Man. Now we put it, oh, when Jesus comes again, he will give a sign like lightning from the north, east to the west. And that'll be the sign of the coming. Jesus, ah, uh -uh, this generation that's going to crucify me. They will be given the sign of the Son of Man as Jonas was given as a sign to the Ninevites. The queen of the south shall rise up to this generation and condemn them. 
Because he led to the list of Solomon, I'm not going to read it all, engraved in Solomon this year. Men of Nineveh shall rise of judgment against this generation shall condemn because they listened to Jonah's preaching and greater than Jonah's this year. Therefore said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they shall slay and persecute that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah which perished between the altar and the temple verily I say unto you it shall be required of this generation somebody's got to help me remember Acts chapter 2 be saved from this evil and warped generation okay Maybe just Luke 21 and then maybe one psalm or two psalms, I don't know. 21 verse 6. As for these things which you behold, the days will come in which there shall be not left one stone upon another that shall be not thrown down. Okay. Verse 12. But before all these things they shall lay hands on you, persecute you, Deliver you up to synagogues and prisons before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Was that a fulfillment of John 16? Did it happen to the apostles? Yes. They were all delivered up. They were all killed. Except John, they could not kill him. They put him in boiling oil. They bound him. They put him up in Patmos. And at the end, he just died. They could not kill John, okay? All the others were either crucified or stoned or killed, but they were all put in prisons. I mean, James was beheaded. They want to behead Peter, and they crucified him upside down. When it was fulfilled. Go to verse 20. Wow. And when you, still speaking to the disciples, shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. That scripture is put in the end time series of all these people that want to steal your money. They say, Jerusalem is now surrounded by armies, so we know this is now the end time. No, no, Jesus talked about that generation. It was fulfilled 70 AD, 30 AD, Jesus came preaching, 33 and a half AD, crucified. 40 years later, 74 AD, Jerusalem is burned down, temple is broken down people are killed in the streets the blood flows for miles the bodies are lying in heaps for up to six months they couldn't even clear up Jerusalem because of the stench of the smell of the bodies the sun could not be seen for three months now we're waiting for something to happen to the church the church is supposed to grow into perfection Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is to take over. The church will not be killed. The church will not be in tribulation. The tribulation was for the Jews of that time. Maybe I'll preach it one day. The first Christian persecution was not by the Roman Empire. It was by the Jews. The book of Acts, no Roman persecuted the church. The Jews persecuted the church. Roman persecution came 300 AD. Shocker. Sucker. The church were not persecuted by the Roman armies. The church were persecuted by the Jews. They opposed Jesus. That Acts chapter 13 we refer to where that false prophet was. You know what Paul says there? He says, you know what Jews? He says, he addressed the Jews. I say unto you Jews, you act yourself unworthy of eternal life because you do not believe Jesus. You did not believe him, now you don't believe us. So we will turn our back on you like Jesus did and we're going to go to the Gentiles. Is there Acts 13, Acts 28, 6, 27, 28? Okay. Let's just read on. Let's just read. Don't switch off. You haven't heard good stuff. Okay, verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things, all things which are written may be fulfilled. 
Verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now we know they say that is when Christ will come again or when the rapture of the church will take place. The trampling down of Jerusalem and the fulfillment of Gentiles was when the Romans, because of the inside work of the Jews in Jerusalem, the Romans from outside set fire, the Jews from inside set fire, and then the nations together with the Romans trampled upon Jerusalem till everything was trodden down. That was the fulfillment. 74 AD, generation completed, all fulfilled. Now it's time to take over, church. That's why it's 68 AD, the book of Hebrews sees the light. And he says, don't be like that or that generation. You can now enter the rest. Are you going to fall in the same trap of unbelief? Or are you going to believe for a change? And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree. Oh, comma, for those who want to get religious. And all the trees. When they now shoot forth. Did you see, didn't say when eat says when they, all the trees, you know that summer is now at hand. So, the parable, not a fig tree, so likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation of vipers, this evil, wicked generation of scribes, hypocrites, Pharisees, shall not pass Till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. Thank you. Anybody? I hope we're going to get good response. Are you getting it? So church, no fear. Jesus said it over and over Everything will happen to that generation. He says, that generation will not pass before the kingdom has come. Jesus said, I will not eat this bread or drink this cup again with you before the kingdom has come. Luke 24, he appears to the people on the road to Emmaus. When he entered their house, he took bread thank the Father, broke it, their eyes were open, kingdom has come. Thank you. Kingdom of God, says Paul, Romans 14, 17, is not eating and drinking. Jesus said, what will I compare this generation with? They went down to sit and eat and drink. Okay, thank you. Kingdom of God is not the eating and drinking, it's righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I can go on and on and on, but let's try and see where we can get to a close somewhere. First Peter chapter 2. Now remember Nicodemus, you must be born again if you want to get the kingdom. Are you born again? Then you are in the kingdom. And the kingdom is in you. Are you born again? Then you are in the kingdom. And the kingdom is in you. Verse 23 of First Peter 1 says, you have been born again. By the immortal seed, the ever-living word of God. Come on, verse 18. You must know that you were redeemed from the useless way of living inherited by tradition from your forefathers. There goes generational curses. Because you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. Come on, the Christ generation we talked about last week. Oh, thank you. No, just, okay. The blood of Jesus and your born again experience has cut off generational curses. Can I help you? Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 29, and many other scriptures, Deuteronomy 5 and Deuteronomy 9, says, I, I will visit the iniquities of those that hate me. To the second and the third generation. I will visit the iniquities of the fathers of those that hate me. Of those that hate me. To second and third generation. Every time Exodus 20, 34, Deuteronomy 5, Deuteronomy 9, over and over it says, comma. But to those that love me, I will show my mercy for thousands of generations. 
Come on, you generational curse preachers. Why don't you preach the mercy to gen- thousands of generations? We love Jesus, man. Yes. So did the foot trackers and the settlers and the Zulus. Even Goodwill. They love Jesus. Come on, somebody help us. Even the Swazis, they love Jesus. So there's no generational curses. The only curse is those who are going back to the law. You could hear how it fell down now, the teaching just fell to the floor. Because there's people, no, no, brother, you must be delivered. Yes, I'll deliver you. I'll take you to the cross, introduce you to the blood of Jesus, and make you be born again by the word, and you're free, forever free. If the Son has set you free, you're free. He says, verse 4, Come to him as a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. Listen to the words. You also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it is contained in scripture, behold, I lay in Zion. A chief cornerstone, Zion the church, not Jerusalem, the church. Hmm. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which is disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, Israel, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling to the house of Israel, says the Bible, a rock of offense to the house of Israel, says the Bible. They stumble at my word, they are disobedient. Thank you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it comes. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. You were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. In time past, you were not a people. Now you are the people of God. You have not obtained mercy. Now you have obtained mercy. Woohoo. Ah, do you like it? Chosen generation. So the generation of Moses, gone. The generation 30 to 70 AD, gone. When will there be a group of people that will say, we are now the chosen generation. We are not destined for destruction. We are not destined for persecution. We are not destined for tribulation. We are not destined for false Christ. We are not destined for false prophets. We are the church which will be built by Jesus himself. Living stones. Zion, the people of God. You got it? Now, if you read on in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, because, you know, he came as a lamb to the slaughter. He took our infirmities. He bore our diseases. He was wounded for us. And uh, now we can all come back to the shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ. So he goes on in chapter 2 and take everything right back to Isaiah 53. Who hath believed this report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord? He grew up as a tender plant out of dry ground. Come on, those who are with me, when everything is destroyed, there will come the man called the branch. Now we can be crafted into him. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. Then he goes on to say, we all like sheep have gone astray, but now we have come back. Then he goes on to say, but his life is cut off from the land of the living. Now who shall describe his generation. Acts chapter 8, there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch from Kandasi, a very rich man sitting on a chariot. 
And the Spirit of God spoke to Philip, the deacon, said, go join yourself to the chariot. He jumped in the gaze of desert strip on the chariot and he heard the man reading. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And the man said, of whom does the right to speak? Of himself or someone else? And Philip started describing to him the gospel story. He said, uh, he was cut off from the land of the living. He took all our infirmities and diseases. Now who will describe his generation? The man said, there's water. Can I be baptized? So he must have heard the whole story that Peter said. Repent, be baptized so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you. So come out of this wicked generation. Okay, you with me? Zion, the people of God. Where you are built as living stones, Jesus being the chief cornerstone, rejected by the house of Israel, but many as believed him can now be born again, and they can be built as a church of the living God. Psalm 102. Verse 13. You will arise, and you will have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, the set time has come. Yea. Hey. When the fullness of time came, God sent his son born of a woman under the law to redeem those under the law that we can now receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God put the spirit of his son in us, crying, My father, you were not a people, are now a people. Somebody. And the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion. Do you remember the stone that the builders rejected? Now Zion is built by living stones. He shall appear. In other words, when we accept this doctrine, there's going to be the appearance of the Christ in the midst of the church, according to Hebrews 2. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. The people who realize they are Zion and they are being built. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven, the Lord behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to lose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion. Verse 24, I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, that your years are throughout all generations. 26 talks about the world, the earth, and the heavens will wax old like a garment. Now we know Peter said you'll be rolled away and people say, oh, they're going to come a new earth and a new heaven. God's first going to throw. He says, they shall be changed. They shall be changed the second time. I just thought I'll throw that one in. Okay, Psalm 22. For those who want to read Psalm 102 in the Amplified, it says, you love the stones of Zion. And people think it's, oh, the stones that are lying all around when God will rebuild Jerusalem. No, no, no. The living stones that are being built into Zion. Amen. Thank you. I'm not going to repeat that. You just got to take that very quickly. Amen. Psalm 22 and Psalm, let's do it both and we know we're finishing. Psalm 22 and Psalm 112 and we finished. Verse 30, a seed shall serve him. And it shall be counted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That he hath done this. Okay, this is just for people that now want to listen. Psalm 112 in closing. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fear the Lord, that delight greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Now listen to this generation. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His righteousness endure forever. Now when it comes to the people of the law, their righteousness are as filthy rags. When it comes to our righteousness, it's made 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the righteous of God. Unto the upright or the righteous, there arise light in the darkness. He is gracious, full of compassion, righteous. A good man shows favor and length. 
and he will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. He's trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endure forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish, but the righteous shall have it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I'll read you a portion of 145 as from verse 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all that fall and raise up those that are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and you give them meat in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is near unto them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserve all them that love him, but the wicked will be destroyed. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless His holy name forever and forever and forever. I can now go on and on and on and I must stop and stop and stop. Oh man, the Lord is good and His mercies are everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. The generation that seek Him. Oh, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall come into His holy mountain? The generation that seek Him.